Keep on praising him. Yes. Come on, let's give him a little more praise. Yeah. God is doing a great work. He's doing a great, great work. How many say, God's still working in me? Amen. Just touch your neighbor and tell him, God's not done with me yet. Tell him, you wait and see. You wait and see what God is going to do in my life as I stay on the journey. I mean, this is a journey, boy. We're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. Amen. Let's give this music team a great round of applause. They just did wonderful. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, this morning, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to stand with me and turn to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, and we're going to read in chapter 11. And this morning, it's just a blessing to be alive. It's a blessing to be in church this morning. I love this first service. This is the service of commitment, the service of, of growth. And, and I'm just excited to minister to you this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to just go ahead and start reading in verse 32, and when you have it, just say amen. All right, it reads like this. It says, and what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, and also of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, work righteousness, obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, and out of their weakness were made strong. Look at this. They became valiant in battle, and they turned to flight the armies of the aliens. This morning, I want to continue on our series that we've been in entitled Traits of the Greats. Before you see it, give your neighbor a high five and tell them I'm glad I sat next to you. All right, go ahead and be seated this morning. The Traits of the Greats. Have you been enjoying this little series we've been in? I'll tell you, I've been thinking, I wanted to kind of just make it the last week, but God has just been giving me more and more and more and more. I think everybody who comes to church wants to be great for God. Isn't it true? That's why we come. We don't come to be average or ordinary. We come because we believe that there is greatness yet to be discovered inside each and every one of our lives. And what I've been kind of teaching you through this series is that next to knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, it's very important to understand that there are some vital traits that every Christian needs. Sometimes we come to church and say, I'm saved, Pastor, I'm ready. But how many know unless you carry the traits of the kingdom of God, you can never really bring God's purpose to pass in your life? I believe it's important to be saved. But I believe that every Christian in this place must also possess something very important. That's something called character. Come on, talk to me this morning. Because if you want to enter into good success, and if you want to continue to walk in the will of God, you need Jesus, but you need the traits of the greats. You need to possess within your life everything it's going to take to take possession of his promises and to walk in his perfect will. Some of the traits we've been talking about are traits like wisdom. How many enjoyed that teaching? We talked last week about attitude. Attitude is important. Attitude is vital in not only in the good seasons of your life, but how many know you need the right attitude when you're in the valley? You need the right attitude when you're in a tough season. Have you ever been there before? And so today I want to take a few moments to talk to you about another important trait that every believer needs. I want to talk to you about something called courage. I can't I don't think you can talk about a series like this, Traits of the Greats, without looking at Hebrews chapter 11. 
It's right there in Hebrews chapter 11 where it begins to outline the traits and the qualities that great men and women in the Bible possessed by faith. So I don't think you can kind of even talk about a series like this without at least cracking Hebrews 11 and talking about the different traits and qualities found in that scripture. Now, one thing you might find in this scripture is that the subject of faith, even though it's the overarching theme of the chapter, you will find that faith takes on many forms in the scripture. In the past, I've talked to you about the Holy Spirit. And I've shared with you how the Holy Spirit takes on many traits and manifestations in our walk. How many remember when I taught on that? Well, when you talk about faith, faith also has different forms. And when you look at these fathers of the faith, they all possessed it within their life. Let's talk about some of the forms of faith. You ready to learn something this morning? Number one, faith comes in the form of sacrifice. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abel gave a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You remember the story. I love, I love people who come to church that read the Bible so you don't have to give them the whole story. Come on now. <laughs> Abel offered a, a better sacrifice than his brother Cain, and it made his brother angry, and it made his brother jealous, but we find that God was attracted to Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's sacrifice. What we find is that faith came in the form of sacrifice, and when Abel sacrificed the best of the land, God was attracted to that sacrifice. And I think that's the message very simply is that when you walk in a spirit of sacrifice and you have the courage to sacrifice for God, God gravitates towards you. The second form of faith is we find that faith comes in living a holy and separate life. See, faith takes on many forms. It's not only sacrifice, but it's also living a life that is pleasing to God. How many just say, I want to live a life that's more pleasing to the Lord? Well, well, faith, faith comes in the form of living a life that's on target. In fact, when you look at this Hebrews 11, Enoch, he did not die a death. All of us will die one day. All of us will die the death that we're sentenced to die and, and destined to die. But Enoch was raptured. He never experienced death because he was the most righteous in the land. Enoch pleased God so much that God just took him. Come on, somebody. And when you look at the life of Enoch being snatched out of the earth, it's a foreshadowing of a day to come. That there will be a day that if we don't pass, if the Lord tarry, that the Lord is coming back for a church that is holy and righteous and without blemish. Listen to me, young people. Because a lot of young people, they don't hear about that type of preaching these days about the rapture and the second coming. But we believe in Victor Outreach that the Lord is coming back and he's coming soon. And he's coming back for a church that's walking right before him. He's not just looking for a blood-bought church. He's also looking for a church that's striving for holiness and striving for right living. See, there's a promise to a person who's living a life on target. We're still talking about courage. Wait for me a little bit. There's a reward. Someone say there's a reward. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 33, it says you shall walk in the way which the Lord your God has commanded you that you may live and that you may it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land in which you will possess. Get a hold of that. What's the secret to long life? Living right. Oh, come on, somebody. What's the secret to long life? Come on, get, letting go of those habits. What's the secret to long life? Turning away from sin. What's the secret to long life? Living according to the word of the living God. Is there anybody with me this morning? If you live according to his command, you're going to have a long life. Ooh. What's the third form of faith? Faith comes in the form of trust and obedience. And we teach a lot about this here in this church. Abraham trusted God for the promises in his life. How many of you have a promise from God? What we find is that Abraham journeyed with God in, in an attitude. We talked about attitude last week. But Abraham journeyed with God in a constant pursuit of the promise. I think that needs to be said in this series. I think it needs to be said this morning because some people, you're not pursuing the promise the way you should be. And Abraham learned very simply in his life that partial obedience is disobedience. You learn that in the home. Who went to the home? You learn not to lean on your own understanding. 
You learn that if you're not following God with a whole heart, you're not following God at all. I think we need a little bit of that in the church this morning. We got a compromising generation. We got a Sunday going generation. We got people coming to church and just checking in and checking out. But Abraham, he pursued the promises of God in his life, not just on Sunday, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Come on, somebody. And all over again the following week. Come on. Who agrees with this type of word this morning? See, faith comes in many forms. And one of the primary themes of Hebrews is that is, is that faith, which is mentioned. But I also want to point to our subject this morning is I want to talk about the type of faith that's related to something called courage. I guess what we can call it is courageous faith. Everybody say courageous faith. What we find here in Hebrews 11 is that courageous faith is found in an overcomer. Courageous faith is found in an overcomer. It mentions Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Samuel, and, and, and the prophets. And all these men mentioned and glazed over in Hebrews 11, these were men that lived the life of an overcomer. Put your hand to your heart and say with me, I am an overcomer. How do we know they overcame is because even though they did not receive the promise, according to Hebrews 11:39, they held on for a better promise. That even though they didn't see every promise come to pass in their days on the earth. And I want to tell some of you this. I, I, I got to be honest with you. Every promise you're believing for will not come to pass. But will you still serve him? So you'll lose half a church like that. You say, I just want to hear about how every promise is going to come to pass and everything's going to be all right. But let me tell you something, baby girl. Everything ain't going to be all right all the time. But the question is, will you still serve the Lord no matter the season you are in? See, they didn't get the promise. They didn't get the fullness of the promise. They held on for a better promise. They held on for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to fulfill the entire law. So they were going to hang out in Abraham's bosom forever. They knew that when Jesus came and he snatched the hells, the keys from hell, that they would come out and they would enter into a better promise. And guess what, friends? If you hold on, that's where you're going to go. You're going to go into a better promise. They recognize that we have a better promise. We have a better hope. We have a better covenant. We have a better priest and we got a better future. Hold on to that word this morning. Hold on to your courage. Don't give up in the middle of your storm. Don't give up in the middle of the battle because God is faithful to bring you through. At the end of the book, it says you win no matter what the devil tries to tell you. We're going to receive it. We're going to receive it. Tell your neighbor, hold on. It takes courage to hold on. It takes courage to hold on. If you want to be great for God... You're going to need some wisdom. You're going to need the right attitude, man. And you're going to need yourself some courage. You're going to, you're going to have to determine in your life that you're going to live a life of courage. There's three types of courage that I believe every Christian needs. This is my message this morning. You can write these down. Number one, I believe that every Christian needs the courage to rise up. These men in Hebrews 11... They didn't hang out low. They didn't hide in the shadows. They didn't retreat. They didn't hide forever in a cave. You might have a season of a cave, but God didn't call you to live there. They were courageous to rise up. And I want to tell you that courage is necessary. If you've been called by God to lead in every in, in any shape, form or fashion which I believe that every person is called to lead. Every person is called to lead. Whether you're leading in the ministry, you're leading your family, you're leading at work, every person's called to lead. And if you want to be a good leader, because people are looking for good leaders. They're looking for good leaders. They're looking for leaders that aren't up and down, that aren't in and out, that aren't moving sideways. They're looking for leaders that have a little bit of courage. And if you want to be a good leader, is there anyone here today? You say, I want to be a good leader, Pastor, then you're going to need a little bit of courage in your life. You're going to need courage. See, courage can only be found on the battlefield.
Courage can only be found in a person who is advancing the kingdom of God. Now, I know a lot of times we think, well, courage is a character trait. I, I'm just, you know, I'm not a man, Pastor. I'm a mouse. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. Character is not so much of a trait in as much it is a, it, it, as it is a will to act. It, it, it's a will. It's in your will. I know we're talking about the traits of the greats, but if you, if you, if you want courage and you, and you desire to move in courage, you have to look within your will. It's when a person that's been down too long is ready to come out of the valley and start moving towards a mountaintop. That's when courage begins to rise up. See, courage isn't so much of a character trait, but it's a will to act. A person with a propensity to get involved in some cause. A person that looks within themselves and they find the cause and courage causes them to move their life in the direction of that cause. See, when we honor heroes, people are usually singled out simply as heroes because they saw a situation and they leaped into action. That's what makes a hero. It is when they see a situation and they leap into action. See, that's why I came to tell you anybody could be anybody could be a hero. Anybody could be courageous this morning. A single mother could be courageous. A grandparent raising their kids' kids could be courageous. A person starting a business can be courageous. A young person who wants to answer the call to ministry can be courageous. A person who's sick in body this morning and they're just tired of being sick. Guess what? You can stir up some courage in your life this morning. You, you can rise up. This Courage will cause you to rise up out the pit. Oh, come on. Help me a little. I'm preaching pretty good. C courage can bring you out. Tell your neighbor, you need some courage. The Greek, the Greek philosopher Sophocles said, heaven never helps a man who will not act. Heaven never helps a man who will not act. So, so at some point in your life, here, catch this part. At, at some point in your life, a person has to stop planning, stop talking, stop thinking, and actually get up and do something about their situation. Come on, guys, I'm not preaching in the next service. Help me feel good about this message. You got to stop planning. I'm planning. I'm planning. You've been planning for two years. Stop talking about it. One day, one day, one day. Stop thinking in, in, the, in the dark and say, no, this is the day I rise up. This is the day I stir up the courage in my life to pursue God's plan. Oh, man, this is awesome. I'm ministering to myself. Because sometimes we think it's in the planning and we think it's in the strategy and we think it's in all the meetings and we think it's all the, in all the work. And I came to tell you at some point in your life, you've got to be sick and tired of being in the same place. There's no dignity in being stuck. And you've just got to say, forget about it. I'm rising up within the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I'm rising up. See, why, why don't we have people that rise up? Because sometimes we're dealing, our challenges, we're dealing with a church that's over-educated and under-obedient. We're, we're heavy on learning and we're light on faith. We're heavy on head knowledge and we're weak in hearts. And we, and we need some people this morning that are going to start developing and moving in a spirit of courage in their walk with God. Why haven't you started that Bible study? Why haven't you made that disciple? Why haven't you started that business? Why haven't you committed your entire life to God? And I came to tell you this is the morning where you draw the line in the sand and say, I'm going to walk in a greater spirit of courage. <laughs> touch your neighbor, Tim. We can do it. It takes courage to pursue the promises of God. It takes courage to move out for God. And it's this word, this Bible, messages like this that awaken a spirit of courage in your life. It's when you position your life under this word every week and you get in the Bible every morning and you seek the presence of God. You don't got the power, but how many know you serve a God that's got all the power? 
He's got all the power, and he's taken that power, and he's put it in you in the form of the Holy Spirit, and it becomes manifest in a type of faith called courage, and all of a sudden, all the people that said you'll never do it, and all the people that said you can never make it happen, all of a sudden, they're forced to shut their mouth when you begin to rise up in a spirit of courage. I'm trying to help someone this morning. God wants you to stir up your faith. God wants you to fan into flame. God wants you to bring that courage alive. Woo. We need the courage to rise up. Now, I want to get to the second area where courage is necessary. And you might not get as many amens on this one. But we need to hear it. This whole series, there's been things that have been said that are making us strong. Because how many know discipline and correction make us strong? And the second type of courage that every Christian needs is they need the courage to confront weakness in their life. See, courage is found on the battlefield. But compromise is found when you come off of it. Courage is found when you're doing the Lord's work. Compromise is found is when you're doing your work. Courage to confront weakness. What am I really saying, man? You say, okay, Pastor, just spit it out. Courage to confront your own sin. See, the kingdom is filled with people who become casualties because they've come off the battlefield. They become casualties, not on the battlefield. They, 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 they suffer something called mission fatigue. And mission fatigue will take you and seek to take you off the battlefield. And I believe there's seasons of healing and there's seasons of, of rest. Even the Lord rested. But God never called you to build a house where he only appointed you to pitch a tent. You got some people that they've been off the battlefield too long. You started this walk on the battlefield. You started this walk in spiritual warfare. You, you learned to fight in, 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 in your discipleship. You learned to pray. You learned to seek God. And then you took a moment to come off the battlefield. And one week turned into a month. And a month turned into six months. And then six months, darn it, turned into two years. And now you're at the point where you're just actually just facing something called spiritual death. Is this too strong this morning? Oh, maybe it's not for you, but you might know somebody this way. <laughs> Say, Pastor, I know a guy. Get back on the battlefield. Get, get out of the compromise. Get back on the battlefield. See, it takes courage. Someone just say courage. Not only to rise up, but to deal with the real root issues in your life. It, it takes courage for somebody who's messed up. Not is messed up, has messed up. It takes courage for somebody who has messed up to right what has become wrong. And, and the problem and, and the things that weaken our lives and ultimately could even weaken the church and weaken the body of Christ are people who try to call their wrongs right. <laughs> you deal with a whole generation like that. You, you, I remember we came with the Lord and, and drinking alcohol was not right. And now all of a sudden you got all these different churches popping up and it's like you can drink. The Bible says just don't get drunk. So we got to hand out breathalyzers, or what do we got to do at that? I mean, <laughs> my Bible says, flee from the appearance of sin. My Bible teaches me, don't put yourself in a place. Come on, somebody. Don't take a job. Don't compromise your values and protect your testimony. Oh, see? See? See, come on, let me get old school helping me. Come on, where's my old school saints? See, sin wants to come in 
And the enemy wants to steal and to kill and to destroy. Yeah. And the sin, sin comes in to distract, to defeat, and ultimately to derail a leader. Come on. The Bible says a little bit spoils the whole lump. And we got a lot of leaders that, that are walking weak because they've allowed compromise to come in. You say, where does courage come in? You got to take what's wrong and make it right. It takes a real man of God, a real woman of God, not that you fall, but that you get back up again. But when you get back up, you get back up in the right spirit. You get back up humble. And you write what is wrong. Why do I bring this out in Hebrews 11? Because in the men that were listed in Hebrews 11.32, every one of these leaders mentioned experienced personal failure and personal defeat, yet they were still listed as great men of faith. Read their stories. Every one of them experienced defeat. But through courage, they overcame their failure. Through courage, they overcame the excuses. They were overcomers. Are there any overcomers here this morning? They, they defeated sin. These were men that excelled on the battlefield, the Bible says in Hebrews 11. They subdued enemies. They closed, the, they closed the mouth of lions. They excelled on the field of battle. But only when they were doing the Lord's work, but when they were doing, when they came off the battlefield, they became vulnerable to sin, extremely vulnerable to sin. As long as they were fighting the good fight of faith, they moved in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, man, I say, God, never take your Holy Spirit from me. Never allow me to come to a place that's so dry in my walk with you that I cannot feel the Holy Spirit. That's a scary place, friends. It's a scary place to be in a season of your life where you can't feel the power of God. You can come to church and you can't sing. You go to the altar. You can't even shed a tear. If you're in that place, you are in danger this morning. But courage will pull you out. They excelled in the battlefield. They subdued the enemy. When they were doing the Lord's work, but when they came off the field of battle, they became vulnerable to sin, vulnerable to compromise. Gideon started well, but he finished poorly by selling out to idols. Samson famously compromised his anointing and it gave, gave away the secret of his success to a hoochie mama named Delilah. Talk to me somebody. <laughs> Devil in high heels. We know the stories. We know the stories of the Bible. We know the stories in the church. We know people that one time walked in power and they're not here anymore. We know people who at one time preached this gospel under a holy gift and under the unction of the Holy Spirit and people were broken and empowered, but they're not here no more. Why? Because they came off the battlefield. And all I'm presenting to you this morning is that you want, do you want to be a champion or be a casualty? It's up to you. It's up to you to stir up your courage. It's up to you to deal with the stuff that's trying to creep into your life. I think the greatest example is David. King David. The man with the heart after God. The man with God's own heart. Who loves to read about him? He was a king. He was a worshiper. He was a chosen young man. He was, a, he was, a, he was a, a warrior, and he was powerful. But you know what happened? Is he listened to the people he was leading. Leaders, let me tell you something, man. Never listen to the people you're leading. They might get mad at you. They might say, why can't I get a meeting with you? Because I don't listen to you, bruh. I, you're not leading me. I'm leading you. My children don't lead me. Well, I'm not happy. You'll get over it. I just keep on walking toward God. I'm Abraham, baby. I'm just moving toward God's purpose in my life. So here's David in a moment of weakness. And his men come and say, you know, David, you, 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 you're too valuable. You're too valuable. You're too awesome. Pastor Al, you're too awesome. 
You know what I'm saying? You don't need to go to fight with us no more. No, David needs to be on the battlefield. A leader needs to be on the battlefield. So what happens is he listens to his men. And he goes and he hangs out while they're all going to battle to fight the Philistines. Every spring they fight the Philistines because they're fighting over the harvest. David says, all right, I guess I'm going to kick back and watch the Super Bowl. (laughs) He walks out on the balcony. Who reads the Bible? Come on, let me see. Who reads their Bible? Okay, good. And you know what happens next. Sin came in. Deceived and derailed David. Because he went home, took off his armor, saddled, uh, stabled his horse, and put down his sword. And hung out on the balcony late at night. And the devil showed up. And in one night, he went from strength to weakness. In one night, someone once said this, it it takes a lifetime to build a good reputation and only a minute to destroy it. Talk to me, somebody. So he sins with Bathsheba and then tries to lie about it. Murders her husband through proxy. Put him on the front line of the battle, the heat of the battle. Gets killed. Thinks he got it covered. But the Lord sees everything. He sets forth this negative momentum in his life. I see it happening even before my very eyes and people, you know, they, they just think the decision's right, they make the wrong decision, right. and this whole negative momentum is released. And every time you lie, you got to cover that lie with a lie. And every time you mess up, you got to cover it up with another sin. It just becomes a vicious cycle. One poet said, oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first practice 2 DC." Edgar Allan Poe. You know, what's amazing about David and what I see happen sometimes in a leader's life is that they express great courage on the battlefield, but they have cowardice in their personal life. They're brave in battle, but when it comes to their personal stuff, they're cowards. Can't deal with the real issues that need to change in their life. It's funny how there's leaders out there, they want to change everybody else, but they don't want to change. (laughs) They want to deal with your stuff, brother, deal with your stuff. Don't worry about me, worry about you. Don't talk about my marriage, work on your marriage. Don't talk about my kids, walk humble and work with your kids. Don't talk about my disciples. Work with your disciples. Are they even serving God? See, you can be brave on the battlefield and a coward in private. And David expressed cowardice in his personal life. He had the image of power, but inside he was weak. He had the image of strength, but inside... He had a lot of things that needed to be corrected. And let me tell you something. I heard this the other day. I thought it was powerful. 90% of the time a leader is removed from ministry is not because of sin. It's because of deception. (laughs) Here's the point. We can deal with humble people, but we can't deal with proud people. If you've sinned and you've messed up, And you've made mistakes this year. Be humble. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody messes up. Everybody makes a bad decision from time to time. But what makes you disqualify is not that you sin. It's that you try to deceive everybody to think that you're not sinning. (laughs) And you try to rationalize your sin. And you walk in a stinky spirit of pride that everybody else is wrong and you are right. Listen, man, you're on your way out. You're not going to make it. It's the people who don't come to the altar with crocodile tears. 
It's the people that come to the altar with the right type of brokenness, the brokenness that leads to the righteousness of God. <laughs> if this ain't for you, at least clap for the person it's for. Come on, somebody. And it's when we try to cover up the issues. We try to cover up the stuff that's going on in our life. You know what would be great in, in our church? If you started having some honest people rise up. People that aren't putting on a front, but they're coming to the altar and then saying, you know what? I, it was the God that saved me, and it's the God that continued to do a work in my life. And I'm humble enough to come to this altar. I'm humble enough to go to my leader and say, would you help me get through this situation? Because God has a big calling and a big plan and a big destiny in my life. I'm not going to get negative. I'm going to get humble. didn't respond until the prophet showed up you know the story and he said you're that man you're that man who sinned you're the man that you're that man that took you're that man that deceived you're the man that thought he got over on everybody and I came to tell you I'm that prophet this morning you're that man you're that woman I'm that man I'm that person that needs to change but how many know through courage, we can be everything God's called us to be. Come on, give God one more praise. I'm done. Come on, give him a big, big praise. I'm almost done preaching. Come on, really? Say yes, Lord. I'm ready. Come on, say I'm ready. I'm ready to be broken again. Psalms 51, that's where David went to paper to pen, and he began to write, create in me a clean heart, oh God. He said, if you cleanse me, I will be cleansed. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Father, fix what's broken in my life. Father, fix what's broken in my heart. Heal me. Patch me up. Put me back together again. Make me into the David, not the David I was in the palace. Make me the David I was in the shepherd's field. Is there anyone here right now ready to go back to your shepherd's field? Come on and praise him right now. I'm done. Come on and praise him. I got one more point. Courage. Say courage. Say it like you got it. Say courage. If you want to be great, you need courage. You need guts. You need the courage to confront your weaknesses. Oh, I feel powerful. I feel the anointing. I feel... Someone says, no more excuses. My day of making excuses is over. My day of blaming people is over. My day of pointing at everybody else has the problem. Today's the day where I look within myself and I deal with my stuff. Woo, powerful stuff. Let me give you the final point. You getting something today? So not only the courage to confront weakness, but finally, and this is what David did, and this is what every great leader does, the courage to change. The courage to change. I got to tell you, man, when I was writing this message, I was thinking back to the first time I heard the gospel. We were hanging out in a park on Whittier Boulevard in Montebello with some friends. And there was a church across the street, and these three young men came across and just stood there. They had a Bible, and we were smoking weed, being young, being stupid thinking we were cool, and said, Jesus loves you. And I'm going to be honest with you, man. It didn't register. Another one said, Jesus died for you. Great. Didn't feel it. But it's when the third one opened his mouth that he got my attention. He said, Jesus can change your life. I'll be honest with you, man. I didn't care if Jesus loved me, man. Love didn't matter to me. What I needed at that time was change. Change is what got me in. 
Change is what got you in. <laughs> you, needed, you needed something to change in you. You didn't come for Jesus. You came for change. It's just that when you got here, they told you who was the one changing you. <laughs> come on, give God a bigger praise than that. It was the blood of Jesus that changed it. Broke all the bondages. Some of you still need it. You see, change is what inspires people. I didn't come for the cross. I came for change. When they told me that there were people in the church that used to do what I did, that got my attention. When I saw certain people that I used to party with start getting saved and changing, that got my attention. Something came alive in me when I saw the people I love and looked up to begin to change. And, and I talk to young people all the time, and they're just, God, they make it seem so painful. It's funny. Oh, it's so hard to serve Jesus. It's so hard to go to church every day of the week. It's so hard to go to do all these things. Go to school and work and so hard. Oh my God, woe is me unto death. <laughs> People are so mean and nasty, and the church is so messed up. <laughs> I look at those people and I say, man, how sad. Nobody wants to follow that. That don't inspire nobody. <laughs> Who the heck wants that? I don't. See, that's how I used to look when I wasn't saved. Life is hard. I got to go to work today. It's too real. And that's what makes me wonder. I wonder the ones who are in church and they're walking like that. Are you saved? No, let's talk about it. Are you saved? Some of these church kids. I think a lot of them come over to hang out. That's so hard. That's so hard. Like last week, it's so hot in San Diego. It's so hot. It's 100 degrees. It's 85 degrees and I'm melting. It's a hotter, ba hotter place. And I'm concerned. Can I talk to my church? I, I think what, what this generation needs they need to understand that change is inspiring to people. What got me is when someone said, through Jesus, I had the courage to change. I, I, I came to a place in my life, I didn't want to be that guy. I had came to a place in my life where life was not important, more important to me than change. And I didn't fall in love with this life. I fell out of love with this life, and I fell in love with God and with heaven. Come on, old school. Help me preach this morning. And what we have today is a church that loves this life. We have a body of Christ that loves this life. We have a generation that loves this life. The church is a burden and the world looks exciting. But if you really want to be inspiration, don't be like everybody else. Be the person God has called you to be. Change got me in. And guess what? Change keeps me in. Change keeps me in. My leadership is built on the platform of change. My message, my gospel is, is built on the platform of change. 
You come to this church on a Sunday morning, 8.30, 10.30, come at night. We're going to preach change because he's a God that can change you. He's a God that can do a miracle. He's a God that can raise up the fullest things of the world. God wants to change you. God wants to change you. God wants to change. Some of you need to be reacquainted with change. Come on and clap for that change. Come on and praise God for that change. Why, why is change so important? Why is it that you not only change at the cross, but you continue to change? Can, can you look at your name? You got to keep changing. Why? Why? I've taught you this. We forget. Because anything under God's order that doesn't change eventually dies. Whatever doesn't change and whatever doesn't keep on changing eventually dies. That's why you got to change. That's why I told Pastor Mark, you sing that song. God is doing a great work. Great work in me. Why? Because he's doing a work. And you may not like the season you're in right now, but guess what? He's trying to change you. You're saying, God, change the season. God say, no, you first. <laughs> hey, 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 come on. And, 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 and people don't change. They don't want to change. They don't want to change. Some of you look at me mad. No, I don't want to change. I, don't, I like my habits. I like my bondage. I love it. That's why I keep it tucked. But don't you know that the more you hide that thing, the more you lose dignity in the house of God? There's no dignity being stuck. There's no dignity when you're the same every year, in and out of the church. There's no dignity in that. It's when you determine in your life that you're going to stay on the trajectory of change, yes, that your life now becomes an inspiration. And don't leave without hearing that. Come on up, up, Brother Matthew. God wants you to change. Because you know why? He wants to keep on using your testimony. Keep on using your testimony. <laughs> it's powerful, man. It's powerful. Who believes it's powerful? Now, why do some Christians die? Why do leaders die? This is important. Because they allow the wrong things to creep into their life. We went, we bought this property. Well, we attained this property recently, one acre property down the street. And the lady that came to us, she's very old. She's 88 years old. Her husband recently passed last year. She has this one acre property that she said, God gave me this property. My husband bought it for me. That If you were to pass, the money that came in through the rent would go towards my retirement, my weekly budget, so I, or monthly budget, so I could live as a widow. And so there was someone that was living there before, they were not being faithful. So she started to really struggle. And being 88 years old, you know, that's, that's a lot. Come on now. We're supposed to take care of the elderly. And she said, I got to get someone in here. She says, what I would love is to have this property for ministry. My son, who lives in Ohio, he wants to demolish it and build apartments. He says, I can make a lot of money like that. But I'm not into money. I want to finish strong, and I want this property to make an impact for the living God, the living God. So when she told me all that, I wasn't going to do it. I said, you know, maybe the Lord is leading us this way. So we took hold of the property, and we attained that in a lease. We got to the property, oh, bad shape. I mean, imagine someone 88 years old having to maintain a one-acre property. Man, you get older. I mean, I can't even, I'm 45. I can't even maintain my car. <laughs> we go in there, and we asked one of our members, 
who has a tree trimming company because all the trees need to be trimmed. And we said, can you bring your trucks and trim the trees? He said, no problem. Always willing. Our people are so willing. I love our people. Loving. They want, they want ministry. They want to make a difference, right? And so we go to the back, and we're looking at all the trees. He's already got the guys trimming some trees. He's like, can you come look at these four trees back here? And there are four trees in the back of the property. And, you know, you get a sermon everywhere. I always get sermons. So we're looking at these four trees, and they all need to be trimmed. They're all looking kind of scraggly. And he looks at the trees. He goes, this one can be trimmed. This one could be trimmed. And this one could be trimmed. I go, well, what about this third one? He goes, no, 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 that, that one needs to be cut down. So it looked good to me. What do I know about plants? Don't give me a plan. I'll kill it. Can I hear an amen? Every plant I own has died. I build people, not plants. Amen. He says, this tree has to be cut. He goes, that tree's dead. I go, man, I go, you really know what you're doing. He goes, yeah, well, this is what I do, Pastor. I work with trees. He goes, that tree's dead. He said, it probably got a disease. I go, trees could get diseases? In my mind, I'm thinking all this. Wow. Probably got a disease. Probably has a fungus. So we walk over to the tree, and at the root of it, he goes, oh, there it is. These big mushroom-looking funguses on the bottom of the tree. He kicks them. He goes, yeah, they're soft. You can just throw them. This tree's dead. And that's where the sermon came in. You got people in the house of God. They look good. But you can't even trim them because they're dead. That's why, watch, let me show you how you can't trim them. Because when you try to challenge them, it doesn't register. Man, come on, we could do it. Man, you know what? God's got a plan. Nothing. No feedback, no nothing. The fungus has crept in. There's a disease that wants to kill the leader, that wants to kill the church. You know what it's called? It's called the disease of ease. The disease of ease. The disease of this is how far I go. Felt good for a while, but doesn't feel the same. I see that in you. I see that in some of you. Can't envision you for the world. Can't envision you for city taking. Can't lead you past that fungus in your life. And, and I'm going to tell you, man, if you don't fix that thing, it's going to kill you. If you don't identify the thing in your life that has to change, it could take your spiritual life. And let me tell you what else it could take, honestly. And I believe this. And this is not hell, hell, what do you call it? Fire and brimstone preaching. This is massive truth. Get ready for it. Put your helmet on. That if you allow that thing to take your spiritual life, that thing could eventually take your entire life. That it pulls you so far away from the will of God, so far away from the battlefield, that you could actually physically die. Because you were not created to go back to Egypt. If God wanted you in Egypt, he would have never delivered you. He would have never got you off that habit. You've got a promise. Come on, who believes it? You've got a promise. You can't go back. And something's got to change. Something's got to change in you. Something's got to change in this church. Compromise, sin, excuses. Young people, don't sell out. Don't sell out. You think it's greener on the, the grass is greener on the other side. No, no, the grass is greener where you water it. Water your grass. God saved you in Victory Outreach, stay in Victory Outreach. Your family comes to Victory Outreach, stay in Victory Outreach.
I want you to stand with me. And I, I feel like this was a good message. I want to make this altar call only for the people that are humble. Enough to say, God, you're dealing with me this morning. But I needed this word. This is like food to my soul. I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for a message like this, Pastor. And this is your moment. And if you believe this message is for you, I want you to just come on up to this altar right now. And I want you to just let the Lord break you. I want you to say, God, do that work in my heart. I want to change. I want to change. I, I, I want to really be a different person, a different leader, a different husband, a different spouse.